welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the book of Matthew. And we are studying this series from April through June of 2016. This is lesson number six in that series for May 7 of 2016. And we hope that you have your Bible handy We'll be looking at a number of passages, and um, we'll find them very interesting, I'm sure. Before we begin, let's offer, ask the, the Lord to guide us in our study. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it always is to gather with your children, to open your word, and to consider the thoughts that you have prepared for us. May all who participate and those who listen to this program be blessed by your word as our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. This particular lesson entitled Resting in Christ is going to focus on the relationships among creation, redemption, the life of Christ, and the keeping of God's law with special emphasis of course on the seventh day Sabbath. To many Christians and maybe especially to Seventh day Adventists when we talk about the God's law, what comes to mind? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. But are those few brief words the best description of God's law that's available to us? Ellen White had these very interesting words to say in Desire of Ages, page 287, paragraph 3. Christ was a living representation of the law. No violation of its holy precepts was found in his life looking upon a nation of witnesses who were seeking occasion to condemn him, he could say unchallenged, which of you convicteth me of sin? In John 8, 46. To correctly interpret God's law, we must see it in the light of the life and death of Jesus Christ. That applies very strongly as well to the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath. All the Gospel writers, including Matthew, that we're focusing on for these three months, talked a lot about controversies between Jesus and the Pharisees, especially sometimes also the Sadducees, over the correct keeping of the Sabbath. What was it about the Sabbath and the way it was understood in Jesus' day that led to so many conflicts between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, especially Pharisees? What do you think? A lot of folks, it was a burden. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly there were certainly very, very strict rules about how you could observe it, right? Um, I'm going to ask someone to look at Matthew 11, verses 20 through 30, for us. Maybe you could read those few <laughs> passages. Tell us what version you've got in front of you. 20 to 30. Yes. That's a long passage. I'm reading from, <laughs> I'm reading from um, the Good News Bible, today's English version. Uh, the people in the towns where Jesus had performed most of his miracles did not turn from their sins, so he reproached those towns. How terrible it would be for you, Chorazin. How terrible for you too, Bethsaida. If the miracles which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would have long ago put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. I assure you that on the judgment day, God will show more, show more mercy to the people of Tyre and Sidon than to you. And as for you, Capernaum, did you want to lift yourself up to heaven? You will be thrown down to hell. And the miracles which were performed in you, <clears throat> if the miracles which had been performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. You can be sure that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to Sodom than to you. And continuing on with verse 25, at that time, Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you because you have shown to the unlearned what you have hidden from the wise and the learned. Yes, Father, 
This was how you were pleased to have it happen. My Father has given me all things. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am the gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put upon you is light. Thank you, Jay. That was great. <coughs> try to imagine yourself living, I'm sorry, try to imagine, you try to imagine Jesus living in Sodom. I mean, what he's saying is his hometown of Capernaum was worse than Sodom? Kind of a replay of Ezekiel 16, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, and a question someone to ask is why is Capernaum <coughs> not, there. yeah, right, not, not, not a dustbin of, of smoke and ashes? So and in what way was, was it worse than Sodom? Well, and that's the question. Could that possibly be true? I, there, there's no question about the fact that they had more light, more exposure to Jesus, for example, than the Sodomites had. But you know, we think of if we think of Sodom as like the worst. Here's here's what it says in Ezekiel uh, 16 regarding Sodom. As I live, says the Lord God, your sisters in Sodom, her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride had pride, surfeit of food, and prosperous ease, but they did not aid the poor and the needy. Mm, 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 mm. Well, the interesting thing is that Jesus goes straight from that terrible condemnation of his hometown and the associated villages to giving a prayer to his father and commenting about his relationship to his father. Um, does that make it even more tragic when you think, here's someone who is God himself living in this city, in this town, representing God to the local people, and he has a direct connection with the Father, no question about that. He offers us this easy yoke. And how do we respond? Worse than Sodom? Wow. You got a comment? Well, I was just... <coughs> I am having a little trouble imagining what he means by worse. Mm -hmm. Are you sure it's not behavior, that it's something else in behavior, that maybe they're not even thinking about God, that maybe they, God is the furthest thing from their mind and, well, yeah. and he's proven it because they're not accepting him as he is? Yeah. Now, in, in, in Jesus' day, most of the people he was preaching to were probably subsistence farmers. <coughs> he, he refers to them as the, the simple, the unlearned. That would be subsistence farmers, I'm presuming. And they were supposed to learn the truth from him. And what was that truth? Um, is he talking about the burdens that we carry? Do we really believe that the sins that we, we seem to love are a burden? And what happens if we give up that burden? Surely the life of Jesus does not suggest that we be lazy. Doesn't seem like a burden to me. Seems like fun. Yeah. Could it be true that by following the example of Jesus, human beings can find a peace and a rest not possible to be found anywhere else? How was it, or is it, that rest related, that rest related to the keeping of the Sabbath? Do you, you think Jesus had was he thinking at all about the Sabbath when he talked about that rest? Not sure? Well, I think that the rest, you know, we talk about sins, the burden of sin, but the sins, but the, the ultimate burden is 
is the resistance of our wills, because mm -hmm. that's where all of this springs from. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and he only did what the Father was doing. You know, he were they were in tandem there, and mm -hmm. so that was really his uh, the expression of God's will and his character. So our will is in opposition to yeah. God's will. It's our natural tendency to just do our will. And uh, so I think um, in yoking with Christ, we are submitting our will. Okay. Uh, Jesus said to Paul on the, or Saul on the road to Damascus, is it hard to ki kick against the pricks with the image of an oxen being driven and trying to be prodded in the right way mm -hmm. and, and kicking back against that? And that's kind of how we are, and, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. to, to, because God is relentless in trying to, to get to us and to draw us, and when we resist that, that's, that's hard work. Yeah. And if we, when we rest in Him, then, then our yoke is easy and our burden is light. It's interesting that probably two or three hundred years now, after the times of Jesus, some of the Jews realized that those strict regulations that were being observed in, by the Pharisees were, 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 were losing their force or being lost. And so they put together a volume called the Mishnah. And this is what it says in the Mishnah. The main classes of work are 40 save one. Do any of these things, do you do any of these things on the Sabbath? Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating or dyeing it, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying a knot, loosening a knot, sewing two stitches. If a button fell off the pastor's Sabbath suit on his way to church, he does not want to look, he does want to look tidy in the pulpit. It's too bad he can't sew it on. Tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, now I'm sure you're all busy doing that on the Sabbath, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, scraping it or cutting it up, writing two letters, erasing in order to write two letters. Now maybe some of you do that. Uh, building, pulling down, putting out a fire, lighting a fire, striking with a hammer and taking out aught from one domain into another. These are the main classes of work, 40 save one. Meaning 39. Meaning 39. <coughs> no, that Mishnah, is a, into English, is a book about this big. Yeah. And years ago, about 30 years ago, I was studying with a rabbi, and he held up the Mishnah, as referring to it here in, in um, Ephesians 2, uh, 14, For he is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, he referred to the Mishnah as a dividing wall of hostility yeah. to the uh, people. Okay, well, so, and then it says, in the Mishnah right there, it says... Uh, these 39 acts of work are treated in various degrees of detail in chapters 11 and following. So, what are some of those details? If, and this is Mishnah, the Mishnah, this is the Oxford edition of the Mishnah, which is probably some years ago, page 120. If, on the eve of the Sabbath, it's talking about as Friday evening as the sun's about to set, if darkness overtook a man while he was on the way, he must give his purse to a Gentile while it's still day, of course. You see, a Gentile was not going to be saved anyway, so let him carry things for you. And if there was no Gentile with him, he must put it on the ass, that is, on his donkey. <coughs> of course, because the donkey is not going to be saved. When he has reached the outermost courtyard of the town, he may take off from the ass such baggage as can be taken off on the Sabbath. And, and which was that? What? What baggage could be taken off on the Sabbath? Well, it doesn't detail that right here. And for what cannot be taken off on the Sabbath, he may loosen the cords so that the sacks fall down of themselves. So you, you relieve the, the donkey, at least, of the burden on the Sabbath. Okay? I think he had to also be careful that if there was a Gentile there, that he didn't look in the, such a way that the Gentile would get the meaning of what he was trying to get him to do. He'd, he'd be glad if he did it, but he didn't want to have the hint. Yeah, I can't give him a hint. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Remember, we just we read that you're not allowed to start a fire or put a fire out. But what if the Gentile is willing to light the fire for you? 
Well, now it becomes a question of your age. If a Gentile came to put out the fire, they may not, if you're, even if your house is on fire, if the Gentile came to put out the fire, they may not say to him, the Jew can't say to him, put it out, or do not put it out since they are not answerable for his keeping Sabbath. But if, a, if it was a minor, a young person, that came to put it out, they may not permit him, since they are answerable for his keeping the Sabbath. That's page 114 in the Mishnah. So in other words, if it's a young person, now you're responsible for his behavior, whereas if it's an adult, that adult is going to make his own choices, so you can say what you want to them, they're going to do what they want. And one of the most unusual rules is about bathing on the Sabbath and drying off. If a man bathed in the water, um, hold on here, I'm getting carried away. Uh, if a man bathed in the water of a cave, shall I read that for you? Yeah, hold on just a second while I get there or in the water of Tiberius, and dried himself, even though it was with ten towels, he may not bring them away in his hand. One wonders what, what that would mean, so there's a footnote. From fear of offending against the principle of squeezing out, however little, the moisture in them. So even with ten towels, you might squeeze out some of the water, which is against the law. So then you see the point. You're not allowed to squeeze a towel on the Sabbath. But you... Hmm... I'm having a little difficulty here. You just the mouse there. Yeah, let's try that. But even so, it's not doing what I want it to do. There. Um, then you see the point. You're not allowed to squeeze a towel on the Sabbath, but you want to dry yourself. Well, use ten towels, and none of them will get very wet, and you will not be a, a, by mistake squeeze them. But no, that's forbidden. So the rule goes on like this. But if ten men dried themselves with one towel, they would be very, it would be very wet then, right? Wiping their faces, their hands, and their feet, they may bring the towel away in their hands. Well, how could that be, the footnote says. So many would keep each other warned of the danger of squeezing. That's in the same, <laughs> on the same page. This is serious. It would be much safer for ten people to use one towel and get it very wet because they would remind each other that they must not squeeze it. But if one man used ten towels, even though the towels would not be very wet, there's a danger that he would forget and squeeze one of them. So the wringing of the towel is the problem. That, that would be work on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So remember that the next time you take a shower, especially on Sabbath. Additional rules. This is in uh, elsewhere in the Mishnah. If a hen lays an egg on the Sabbath, is, is it okay to eat it? The majority opinion of the Pharisees was that if the hen was an egg-laying hen, then it was not okay to eat an egg laid on the Sabbath because the hen was working. However, if a hen was not an egg-laying hen, if it was just a hen being fattened up to be eaten, then it was okay to eat the egg because that wasn't the hen's primary labor. There was also a suggestion that you could eat an egg laid on the Sabbath by a laying hen as long as you later killed the hen for breaking the Sabbath. So, so this, this in particular has to do with working on yeah. the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So really what's wrong with this in that aren't these people just trying to, to, to do the right thing? Yes. And, and what's wrong with, with going the extra mile? Well, that's what they were doing. <clears throat> and we know what Jesus said about it, and we'll read more, a lot more about that in a few minutes. Well, Ellen White, in talking about dietary principles, said that uh, you can be as hard as you, you want on yourself, but you should be gracious to others, and yeah. that's, that's what happens here, the yeah. opposite of that. They're not being gracious. This is what you have to do. Is it okay to look at yourself in the mirror on Sabbath? The answer is no, because if you see a gray hair, you might be tempted to pluck it, and that would be reaping, and as such is a violation of the Sabbath. Now, I don't know, some of us would be reaping for a long time. If your house catches on fire, is it okay to go salvage your clothes? Well, the answer is you should carry out only one set of clothing. However, if you put on one set of clothing, then you may carry out another set. By the way, if your home catches fire, it's not okay to ask a Gentile to put out the fire. But if the Gentile is putting out the fire anyway, that's okay. Well, that's nice of him. 
Yeah. Is it okay to spit on the Sabbath? <laughs> the answer is, you may spit on a rock, but you may not spit on the ground because that would be making mud or mortar. Can't spit on the fire either, I assume. I probably can't spit on the fire either. <coughs> now, is it okay to breathe? Yeah. So as, as Dennis was saying, this is kind of the, the leaders making sure that the people knew how to keep the Sabbath. Yeah. They're trying to be extra helpful. Mm -hmm. I think there was a big dose of pride in there. <laughs> big I, dose of pride. They were so Those were Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. Yes. Let me, let me I'll Adventist. just, I'll just uh, refresh me on the story here. You were talking about spitting in the mud and you're making mortar and that's work. Yeah. There was a time when Jesus... But not on the Sabbath. Oh, that's what I, well, but did, <laughs> that was my question. I don't remember the story so well. There was a time when he a blind man. fixed, blind man. mixed this little mortar and put it on the man. Did he do this on the Sabbath? Is that? Hold on now. I'm I trying to remember. Actually, it was on the Sabbath. I always wondered what was, what was the big deal with the mud thing here. Yeah. And the breaking of the Sabbath. And, uh, uh, we, you know, I get hung up with what, what is this magical healing that goes on with the, with the, yeah. with the eye, but I'd never thought about, well, I never heard this passage before, about, <laughs> but, but in essence, he was, uh, in part, what he was doing was making this mortar and putting it on this guy's eye, I guess. challenging them up with their own rules. That's <laughs> yeah. what he was doing. Have, have we lost the true import of the Sabbath? Do we need more rules? No. We're what all old enough to remember the, the swimming. The, you could oh, walk yes. in the water, but you can't swim. You could trail behind the boat on a raft as long as you weren't really swimming. You weren't enjoying it. I see. <laughs> Whatever you do. <laughs> I encountered that. It was well, very that, foreign to me. Yeah, <laughs> what do you suppose the whole command for not working is for? Well, the command itself, if you read it, says you're supposed to lay aside your usual responsibility, your usual work of the week, and this is a time to be with your family, to be with God, to rest. To, rest. to cease to, doing what you were doing. Uh, Isaiah 58 calls it a delight. It was made for man. Yeah. So, so we're supposed to, so we are supposed to enjoy it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what rest is all about. Well, but right? not too much. Not too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's all right this. if you're down at the beach, it's all right to kind of wade in the water. But you can't go out there and start swimming and and snorkeling and and Widen having the, water the fights and those kinds of things. So, right? What straight that? face? Come on, we're, we're very people are watching. I remember <laughs> when I went over to a friend's house on Sabbath, and it was like the middle of the afternoon. Well, this friend had the neatest electric train down in the basement, and um, we couldn't go down there till after sundown. And all I could think about was going down there to do the. Uh -huh. The train, and uh, it kind of ruined Sabbath for me. So maybe they should have took the train clear out, right? Not even got into that kind of stuff. Yeah, lock the door. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have let you know it was there, maybe. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I think no you know, no. this. I think this is a legitimate. Uh, I think there's some legitimacy here with with waiting and 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 not going all the way out. Um, mm -hmm. Now maybe I'm I'm wrong there, but um, I know uh, I can remember people talking about well, not they wouldn't let you ride a bike on the Sabbath, and I can see that you know I taught in a boarding school, and I can see how I and maybe my son and my family might go out and ride a bike, but if we decide to take everybody out for you know the dorm out or 25 or 30 kids, then um, it's real easy for the whole thing to really pretty soon where we're doing jumps and so I think I think some people have confused mm -hmm. that you've got to have some limit somewhere along the yeah. line and, and that's the challenge right yeah and and well, when how? when when you when you with people I remember people talking about this well we couldn't ride our bikes or something well Part of that, I think, in certain settings, was because People this, 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 the potential for this turning into uh, a yeah. Sport. But isn't that fun? I thought we were supposed to enjoy the Sabbath. Yeah. I mean, why not? Why so, not do some jumps? That's, that's kind of 
Is it that we're supposed to enjoy it, or are we supposed to be thinking about God and our relationship with Him? Well, and, and enjoy family. that aspect. Mm -hmm. that, okay, so then we shouldn't even be riding bikes then. I think. Well, a, Jesus had some comments. Let's see if this will help us. <laughs> can, can someone read for us Matthew 12, verses 3 to 8? See if we can remember. I Go got ahead, that Gordon. from the Good News okay. Bible. Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did that time when he and his men were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his men ate the bread offered to God, even though it was against the law for them to eat it. Only the priests were allowed to eat that bread. Or have you not read in the law of Moses that every Sabbath the priests in the temple actually break the Sabbath law, yet they are not guilty? I tell you that there is something here greater than the temple. The scripture says, it is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. If you really knew what this means, you would not condemn people who are not guilty, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It's interesting to notice uh, that we talk about something here that's greater than the Sabbath. Um, David, what was David's situation on that time when he was escaping? Saul was trying to kill him. He escaped. His wife helped him to, 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 to deceive the soldiers that came to kill him, and he ran away, and he went to the priest, and the priest, priest it says, the, Matthew says he went into the temple, but he didn't actually. The priest brought the bread out to him. So, a uh, little, little difference there, but anyway, um, Apparently, Jesus felt that was fine. What's he saying by that? Is he saying human need is more important than somebody's rules? What's he saying? I think so, because David hadn't eaten in a while. They'd been, mm -hmm. They were famished. Aren't you, aren't you making up another rule by saying human needs are more important than... Well, I'm, I'm asking <laughs> you to tell me what the Bible actually says, what Jesus said. I need some clarification on this bread thing. There were, mm -hmm. there were, as I understand it, there were 12 loaves of, of bread in there. Well, David shows up, and my perception is he shows up with his entire gang. Yeah, Now, not, that, not a huge number. Well, they had, I don't see how 12 loaves of bread is going to, I'm going to, I'm guessing they may have 25. Five. Hmm? I think he only asked for five or something like that. Yeah. In, uh, but First Samuel 21, 1 to 6, you can read but, it there. Um, what, um, maybe I'm wrong here, but I'm, I'm guessing he showed up with maybe 10 or 15, maybe 20 guys. Mm. And maybe I'm inferring maybe that's wrong. Maybe there were just a couple, three of them or something. But I, I don't see how these, even 12 whole loaves is going to satisfy yeah. The, yeah. <clears throat> the, the hunger. Well, so how... how I have a question. Yeah. Going back to number two in our handout here, <coughs> where uh, Ellen White states that, or following what Jesus said, um, which of you can convict me of sin? I think we've had this discussion before, what is sin? Mm -hmm. And how, I, I mean, he threw that out there. Not everybody thinks one thing is a sin, another, you know, when he just lays a blanket statement out there, then what is sin according to what Christ? Because it's interesting in light of that, the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought he was kidding, committing all kinds of sins. Exactly. <laughs> so. Whatever is not of faith is supposed to be sin. Okay, so now we have, we have an ethical question. How do we decide what is most important to do on the Sabbath? Would that be feeding the homeless, caring for the sick? Would be, that be more important than going to church or Sabbath school? How do we, how do we make those kinds of ethical decisions? Jesus was continually trying to rid the Sabbath of meaningless rules in order to uh, make it once again a day of delight. So how do, how do we do that? Well, Ellen White, once again, Desire of Age, said, In the days of Christ, the Sabbath became so perverted that its observance reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men rather than the character of the loving Heavenly Father. Desire of Age is 284, paragraph 0. Can you think of any rules that you might have grown up with, and we're still chuckling about some of those, or still observe, which might seem a little strange and foolish to others? 
The Gospels are full of incidents in which Jesus was in conflict with the Pharisees over the Sabbath. We know um, that the Gospels were not written until 20 or 30 years or perhaps more, especially in the case of the Gospel of John, after Jesus had returned to heaven. Surely if it was Jesus' intent for the Sabbath to be changed, sorry, I'm having a little fun with the computer here, for the Sabbath to be changed and Sunday to become our day of worship, the Gospel writers would not have spent so much time writing about his observance of the Sabbath and his defense of true Sabbath keeping. Does, does that make sense to you? I mean, why are they still talking all about this Sabbath keeping stuff 20 or 30 years later if supposedly where did Jesus where did Jesus um, protect the Sabbath it seems like everywhere I look in the New Testament he's telling everybody to back off he said he was well, Lord of the Sabbath he said so. he was a Lord of the Sabbath but so. still how is that he's, he's still downgrading it because he's talking about somebody he, bigger than the Sabbath is he downgrading when he says it's all right for his disciples to some wheat and eat it? Well, he's telling them back off. Let them pick the wheat and, and do it and eat is, it. Is it wrong to eat it on the Sabbath? Well, it must not be. He no. told them that it's, you know, well, don't, don't go to that extreme. Just you let them go. You can harvest and you can thresh and so on, which is, in a sense, what the disciples were doing. They were harvesting wheat. They were threshing it, rubbing it in their hands. and Winnowing, winnowing it. Winnowing. Blowing so, away the chaff. So yeah. what are you saying? Oh, where's the line that you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pointing out that they were doing all the work that they weren't supposed to be doing. Well, I wonder, you know, they were good Jews, so why would they do that? You know, it seems like they should, did Jesus say, did they ask Jesus, is it okay for us to do this, or or did he tell them to do probably it, or they, how did that come about? Probably they had been with Jesus on previous occasions when there were no Pharisees around and done it, and yeah. they felt quite comfortable doing it. I have a feeling that a lot of people did a lot of things while nobody was looking. <laughs> I mean, come on. How do you look at all that stuff? Who could yes. live that way? Yes. Well, there's a, a story in Matthew 12, verses 9 to 14. I'm not going to read that right now. You can look at it in your Bibles if you like. I'm going to read Ellen White's comment in Desire of Ages 286, paragraph 2. Upon another Sabbath, as Jesus entered a synagogue, he saw there a man who had a withered hand. The Pharisees watched him eager to see what he would do. The Savior well knew that in healing on the Sabbath he would be regarded as a transgressor. But he did not hesitate to break down the wall of traditional requirements that barricaded the Sabbath. Jesus bade the afflicted man stand forth and then asked, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Now you can see the Pharisees are over a barrel. Because, I mean, here's a person who... I don't know what the problem was with his hand. He couldn't use it, obviously. And everybody recognized it would be a good thing to fix the man's hand, right? So if you, if you say, no, you can't fix the man's hand, what are you saying? Well, and it was probably the doctrine of the day. You, you could do good things on the Sabbath. Well, it was a, maximum among, a maxim among the Jews that a failure to do good when one had opportunity was to do evil. So now they were in a double bind. To neglect to save life was to kill. Thus, Jesus met the rabbis on their own ground. How many of the other people besides Jesus were able to heal that man, whether it was Sabbath or another Nobody. day? Nobody. None of them. That's no. Right. So how was it that the Pharisees had become so confused in their thinking that they would allow people to go to considerable effort to pull livestock out of the ditch but they would not allow a human who was, suffering, who was suffering to be healed. A careful study of the history of the early Christian church reveals several important facts about the keeping of the Sabbath. The 5th century historian Socrates Scholasticus wrote, this is in Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, page 289, almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, that's the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week. So this is still in the 5th century. This is 400 years after Jesus. Yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, refused to do this. So what's he saying? 
He's saying all the churches observe the Sabbath except a couple of these so-called leading churches, right? Well, there are many passages. We could, uh, if you would want to just scan briefly through the following passages, Mark 1, 21, 6, 2, Luke 4, 16 to 20, 30, uh, 6, 6 to 11, 13, 10 to 16, and 14, 1 to 5. I mean, just a bunch of them there. If one were to take the time to review all the passages in the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament about Sabbath observance, it would become very clear that none of the New Testament writers ever supported a change in the day. In fact, the first unambiguous use of the, of the term Lord's Day, as well now, if you know a little bit of Spanish, Saturday is called what? Sabado. Sabado. So still, it's, it's recognized as the Sabbath. What's, what's Sunday called? Domingo. Domingo. What does that mean? Domingo means Lord. So they called Saturday Sabbath, but Sunday they call the Lord's Day. Okay? So. Um, well, the Catechism refers to Sunday as the day that follows the Sabbath. Yeah. I get your bones about it. So the first unambiguous use of the term Lord's Day for the first day of the week in this instance, the Resurrection Sundays, referring to specifically, appears in the little apocryphal book called The Gospel According to Peter, and I'm sure you've all read that many times, <laughs> which was composed around A.D. 175, okay, so all, 150 years after Christ. And I quote, this is in the, anti, the Gospel According to Peter, verses 9 and 12, in the Anti-Nicene Fathers of Volume 9. And in the night in which the Lord's day was drawing on, as the soldiers kept guard two by two in a watch, there was a great voice in the heaven. And they saw the heavens opened, and two men descend from thence with great light and approached the tomb. And that stone which was put at the door rolled of itself and made way and apart, and the tomb was opened. And both the young men entered in. Skipping down now to verse 12, And at dawn upon the Lord's day, Mary Magdalene, a disciple of the Lord, fearing because of the Jews, since they were burning with wrath, had not done at the Lord's sepulcher that things which women were wont to do for those that die and for those that are beloved by them. She took her friends with her and came to the sepulcher where he was laid. So there's 150 years after Jesus is gone, the disciples... Um, I mean, that Mary and her friends come to the um, come to Jesus' tomb on the Sabbath day. Uh, I'm sorry, on, on Sunday, after the Sabbath. And that's the first unambiguous use of the term Lord's Day for Sunday. Um, look at Matthew 12:12. 12, 12. Would one of you read that for us, Matthew 12:12? 12, 12? How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, or well on the Sabbath, literally. Okay. What New did American Jesus, standard. New yeah. American standard. Okay. What did Jesus have specifically in mind when he said it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath? What would Jesus have included in the category of good? Healing. Healing, yes. He obviously did that. Teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, good is good. <clears throat> anything, <clears throat> would it be anything to, to help? Yeah. You know, someone, for example, I own a service station, <clears throat> and people need gas on the Sabbath. There you go. See? So why shouldn't I stay open and supply people's needs? Or you own a restaurant. Feed people. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So... And it would be be better if you didn't get paid for it. Now that that, well, the, that the example Adventist is church, supposed to raise a fuss, not get approval. The Adventist Church had a big <coughs> discussion about that back in the early days, and there was a problem, especially for physicians, because everybody recognized that the physicians were doing good. So was it all right for Adventist physicians to see patients on the Sabbath? Well, the initial response was. Well, if you see a patient on the Sabbath, you ought to pay at least a double tithe, and maybe you should give all the money to the church, or maybe you shouldn't charge at all. Well, guess what happened when the Adventist doctor said, well, 
if you come on the Sabbath, we won't charge you. <laughs> Everybody Everyone came on the Sabbath. Everybody wanted to come on the Sabbath. So that that didn't work at all. So I mean that was that's that's a known fact in our early church history. So I want an answer about my service station. Well, and and, and that's a fair question. The answer which should be we should get from the scriptures is you're supposed to prepare your car if you need gas, you're supposed to fill it up on Friday. Yeah, but these are Gentiles. They don't know any better. But they still well, need gas. Well, then the Gentiles can get gas from Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think if we seek to do the will of the Father, he will help us to, to know. Because all of this should really flow from a relationship to him, not from some type of collection of external yeah. things. Now, having these little... Um, ideas can be helpful in terms of feedback mechanisms and, and such, but it doesn't really change the inner workings of our heart and our behavior. In Isaiah 58, there's a whole passage from verses 7 to 14. We won't take time to read all that right now, but maybe verses 13 and 14. Someone read, us, read that for us, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. <coughs> Whoever's got it handy. New American Standard. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honoring it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, doesn't that sound like a conflict? Because there at the beginning you said, if you refrain from doing your own pleasure, then you'll delight in the Lord. <coughs> doesn't that sound like a conflict? Well, it turns out that the word for pleasure there just means doing your own business. The good news specifically inserts or has there, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. Okay. okay. It lists some specifics. Mm -hmm. Well, surely these verses make it very clear that the Sabbath was never intended to be a burden. It was intended to be a delight. But down through the years, few subjects of a religious nature have resulted in more conflicts than the day for Sabbath observance. Well, here's an example. Here's, here's some words that will maybe resonate. With or without religion, this is quoted from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, May 6. With or without religion, someone said, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. <laughs> That's sad, but it's true also. In the 1600s, French mystic Blaise Pascal famously warned, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. I think we see that today, wherever you look just about. Yeah. <clears throat> That's true. Though these statements are somewhat overstated, there is unfortunately some truth to these statements. This truth can be seen in the context of this week's lesson in regard to the Pharisees and the Sabbath. Ellen White wrote these words, When Jesus turned upon the Pharisees with the question whether it was lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill, he confronted them with their own wicked purposes. Why is that? They were hunting his life with bitter hatred while he was saving life and bringing happiness to multitudes. Was it better to slay upon the Sabbath as they were planning to do than to heal the afflicted as he had done? Was it more righteous to have murder in, your, in the heart upon God's holy deed than to love all men, which finds expression in the deeds of mercy, in his deeds of mercy, if we might say, Desire of Ages 287, paragraph 1? Well, what about that? I mean, didn't they know, <coughs> excuse me, didn't they know that they were planning murder on that day? And didn't they know that was absolutely wrong? I think it was superseded by the fact that that was what they had going and they didn't care. Some might have, 
Nicodemus and the likes, but I think there was a hard core that didn't care at all. I thought it was a, a good thing. You're supposed to do good things on the Sabbath, and they were ridding the culture and the countryside of this influential um, so what, what was rebel. Wrong? What was wrong with Jesus? Well, he had the temerity to, to bring it up and throw it in their face, and they <laughs> knew he'd caught them. <laughs> well, the, the, the truth is, let's, let's, just, let's just summarize, they knew that if he continued and he convinced the whole nation to follow him, it would destroy their authority. That's right. It would bring down their power. So what really is happening is they're worried about their position, about their authority, right? Yes. As we consider what God wants, and especially what he has in mind for the observance of the seven-day Sabbath, there are, some ver there are many passages in the Bible. I think of Matthew 9, 10 to 13, Psalm 51, 16 and 17. You remember David's Psalm of Confession? Hosea 6, 6, but especially Micah 6, 6 to 8. Would someone read that for us? Micah 6, 6 to 8. Sorry, I don't have that handy on my computer. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Wow. Well, but the Jewish authorities would say, <clears throat> if you want to know how to do that, follow the guidelines in the Mishnah. Well, yeah, they probably would. In light of such passages, why are so many of our Christian friends, Christian friends now, adamant against the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath? What are our best arguments in favor of keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath? You ever tried to put together an argument? Or is it our behavior on the Sabbath a more powerful argument? If we were really keeping the Sabbath as Jesus did, and as he wants us to, would that win people? Now, unfortunately, we can't go out and heal people and that kind of stuff miraculously on the Sabbath. But could we... Could we keep the Sabbath in a way that would be... Well, why can't I keep Sunday or Monday or Tuesday? Well, I mean, that's the, the question. The, <clears throat> why does it have to be and what, what this particular can you day? Show that Jesus did on the Sabbath or didn't do on the <clears throat> Sabbath that he didn't do any other day? Well, let me ask you a question. Does your wife think it's important that you remember her birthday? Well, that's that's a good point, but I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to give me or an example. Or maybe your anniversary. You're trying to give me an example out of my life. I'm trying to get, ask you for an example out of Jesus' life. Yeah. So what did he do? What in the scripture can you see that's clear that Jesus did special on the Sabbath that he didn't do any other day? He went out of his way to break the Pharisees' rules yeah. by healing people by do, being kind, but especially healing people. So he went to confront people on the Sabbath. <laughs> well, he, he, what he did is he said, we need to break down the wall of partition. Remember what Jim read to us from Ephesians 2. <clears throat> the, the break down the wall, because that's the wall that was a mile high between Jews and Gentiles. They thought, we're keeping all these rules. And look at those Gentiles out there. They don't even know about the rules. So there's no way they can be saved, right? Yeah, but the, <clears throat> the Sabbath is kind of a, it would fall in the category of a ritual. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for this ritual. There's a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the real big purpose is your, it, it appears to me, or a significant component of it, mm -hmm. it's a memorial of the Creator. Okay. And, 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 if you 
there's a, there's a reason you need to remember yeah. that. Think about the major <laughs> events in the Bible that are connected with the Sabbath. You've already mentioned creation. It's also connected with the release of the slaves from Egypt because he took them to Mount Sinai and he gave them the Sabbath there. It's also connected with the death of Jesus because he rested in the grave over the Sabbath. Aren't those maybe the most important events in Scripture? I mean, there's some others that we would maybe put up alongside that, but those are three of the really, really important. Maybe God wants us to think about those things and the implications of those things on the Sabbath. Well, I would think, well, he could have done any of those things on some other day than the Sabbath. But he my, didn't. My, disp Why? my disposition is that he did those things to emphasize mm -hmm. the value that he places on, on the fact that we should um, embrace and celebrate um, that day. He has, he has told us that the Sabbath is supposed to be our time to get together with him to celebrate. If the President of the United States said, I want you to come to the White House and meet with me next Sabbath. Now, maybe I shouldn't choose a Sabbath since we're Adventists. Another day, Monday. I want you, would you say, well, I think I'll show up on Tuesday? It's better in my calendar. My schedule. Yeah. yeah. Well, would God be offended at that? Well, he might just not be there. Yeah, but God's well, around all the time. I don't know. Yeah. He can, he can, but he, he interacts says, with us. For, for whatever at, at reason. All times. Yeah. But, but so it, it, what, what the implication here, the conclusion would be, and maybe for us or even Sabbath keepers, you know, there's something possibly more special here that's supposed to be happening than maybe even what we, real, what we realize. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing we're talking about, we're kind of assuming one Sabbath. The Bible, the Old Testament, talked about Sabbaths well, uh, in plural. Days of rest, and there were other days of rest, yeah. And, and there, was, there was the Passover Sabbath, which was very important, yeah. and that some people point to that. That's what Deuteronomy's talking about. Okay, well, in the few minutes we've got left, left let's see if we can draw some conclusions. It is very clear, whether we like it or whether we don't like it, that God blessed the seventh day. That's repeated many times in Scripture. Apparently, he thought that was important for some reason. So what do we do on the Sabbath to make it special? Do you think about creation? Do you think about release from the slavery of sin? Do you think about the meaning of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Those are things that are connected with the Sabbath. And shouldn't they certainly lead us to be, to be joyful and celebrate the Sabbath? Are there things that make you worry and stress during the week that you can forget about on the Sabbath? Well, that is an interesting concept, much. is that you can take all of those, all of your burdens, all of your work, all of your labors, all you're supposed to do, and you can ig basically ignore it mm -hmm. on the basis that God said, with, <laughs> with divine authority, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Well, most religions end up being a list of do this and don't do that. True Christianity is defined by, defined by Jesus himself is to come to him, lay aside our burden of guilt and sin, and accept his rest. What does that mean? Do you think the Sabbath is the best day of the week for you? Why, why is that? Is it because you spend more time with God, with your family, uh, because it's more restful, it's a change of pace. All of the above. All of the above. Why couldn't I spend every day like that? Why well, you got to make a living, don't you? <laughs> well, Jay's going to retire soon, so you know, he's not going to have to he's do that. To be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Ellen White says, Christ is speaking to every human being, whether they know it or not, all are weary and are heavy laden. All are weighed down with burdens that only Christ can remove. The heaviest burden that we bear is the burden of sin. If we were left to bear this burden, it would crush us. 
But the sinless one has taken our place. He invites us to cast all our care upon him, for he carries us upon his heart. It's our pages 328 and 329. So how does Christ actually bear our burdens, our sins? And how is that related to the Sabbath rest? Our lesson suggests that only Jesus can offer that kind of rest. Is that true? Is there any other individual in the universe who can offer us freedom from sin and guilt? Think of the biggest burdens that you bear during the week. Are they related in any way to selfishness, greed, impurities in your life or thinking? Maybe financial worries, concerns about family or friends? How can the Sabbath rest help us to turn to Jesus and let him carry those burdens? It is not an invitation to a life of Jesus' invitation is not an invitation to a life of ease and indulgence. It is an invitation to a life of service and an escape from legalism into the freedom offered through God's grace. Can you remember a time when you thought of the Sabbath as a burden? We talked a little bit about that earlier, didn't we? Or at least an inconvenience? What about your train? Why was that? What other priorities did you have in mind at that time? Were they really more important than rest, the rest that Christ offers? The Bible describes God's law as a gift of joy and delight, and there's many verses, especially Psalm 119 says it many times. Isaiah 58, 13 we looked at, calls the Sabbath a delight. All through the Bible, the Sabbath is connected with the great acts of God, especially creation, recreation, freedom from slavery in Egypt, the great answers that God gave to the issues in the great controversy by the death, rest in the grave over Sabbath and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, and finally our salvation in our future home where we will celebrate every Sabbath with our Lord, Isaiah 66, 23. God sustains our lives every day. He could stop. What, what would happen if God stopped working on the Sabbath? We would all die. We could not survive. Every heartbeat is a result of God's work. But it's work that he loves because he loves us. There's no... Well, think about what things you do on the Sabbath. They're running out of time. But think about what things you do on the Sabbath and whether or not those things honor God's name. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this brief opportunity to think about your word, about the Sabbath, about all that it should mean to us. May it, may it truly be a day of delight. May we come to recognize our time with you as the best time of our lives, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.